book of Zechariah, and this is kind of a, we've been looking at this in a three-part kind of section. Section one, I'm, I called Revelation, chapters one through six. Section two, what we'll look at today is on the subject of repentance in chapters seven through eight. And then section three, I think we have these, we have this as a screen too, TJ. Section three, I'll slow down there. Renewal, we'll look at that starting next week. So today we'll focus on that center section of repentance. And you're like, wow, there's a Mother's Day message, repentance. Mothers, repent. That's not, uh, you know, I try not to like, um, you know, unless it's like an Easter or Christmas, I tend, I, we tend to just kind of keep, where, where are we at? Where does God have us at? And I, because I believe moms, the Lord has a message for you. But everybody else, the Lord has a message for you. And uh, we want to look at this passage together and believe that it's relevant for us. These two chapters that we're going to look at focus in on a time in the life of the people of Israel, the Jews. The Jews had been taken captive by the Babylonians for 70 years, and now they're back. God said it would be 70 years, and about about five to seven years before that ended, many of the Jews started to go back to the land of Israel, specifically into the area of Jerusalem, and Zechariah, and, and they were starting to rebuild the temple, but things slowed it down. The people around them, the people groups around the city of Jerusalem were, uh, were very opposed to the idea of the Jews rebuilding their temple. More than them even rebuilding a temple, they were opposed to the idea of them rebuilding a wall around their city, right? Because a walled city is a protected city. And the, and the nations, the tribes around Jerusalem wanted the Jews, you know, they didn't even want them back in the land, but because the king said they could come back, they had to let them back, but they wanted to keep them defeated, shamed, discouraged, unorganized. But the Lord had promised that he was going to reestablish them in the land. And this was a very, very difficult time for the Jewish people. They were humiliated for 70 years. And now they're back in their land, some of them, but it's not like it used to be. And the older generation that had seen what it used to be were crying because they were so discouraged at how terrible things were. And then the, the younger generation comes in with like kind of an excitement about, yay, we're back, but they, they're getting crushed by those on the outside and those on the inside. It's a discouraging time for everybody. Zechariah chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, in the fourth year of King Darius, it came to pass that the word of the Lord came to Zechariah. On the fourth day of the ninth month, Chislev, when the people sent Sherezer with Regem Melech and his men to the house of God to pray before the Lord and to ask the priests who were in the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophet saying, should I weep in the fifth month and fast as I have done for so many years? Don't get caught up on all the names and all, the, all those things, but we know exactly when Zechariah wrote this. We know the exact date. In fact, I'll give it to you. December 4th, 518 B.C., we know it because he was very specific in his, you know, on this day of this day of this month and this person. So today we just say Mother's Day. Everybody kind of, we got it, you know. If you say Mother's Day, though, and you're from a different culture, you're like, well, which one? Right? Mother's Day in Europe already happened. We have it today, right? But if you say the exact date, what is it, May 7, May 8, May 7, May 8? See, there you go, right? If you say an exact date, you know when it is, right? And so Zechariah gives them a sense of when things were. And during the 70 years of exile that Jeremiah said was going to happen, the people started new traditions, really good ones, actually. These traditions that started were traditions of fasting. They would fast on the dates of their, like, humiliation as a nation. When, oh, we got kicked out of Jerusalem, let's declare a fast. Oh, this happened, let's declare a fast. So they ended up with several different days of fasting that were meant to kind of, they were like days of mourning. You know, I, I mean, I, again, having 
come and live from a different part of the world, the Eastern European world, most of our holidays are days of mourning because there's been a longer history, you know, and your history is not one of like conquered and independence and victory. It's of defeat and of shame and of, of loss and of pain. So you remember these days and there's moments of silence and solitude and you just, you reflect upon where things were and where they are today. And the people came to the leadership of this small little community in Jerusalem. And they're asking, like, should we continue to fast? Should we still do these things on these days? And remember, there was one fast in the, New, in the Old Testament, one declared fast that was really important. It was the fasting on the Day of Atonement. When the high priest would go into the the holy of holy area in the temple. He would offer a sacrifice and then God would receive it and all the people were forgiven. And it was like a, it went from like a day of, a moment of mourning to a moment of celebration because they were mourning their sins and then when God forgave them for the year, they were then overjoyed with God's forgiveness and you did this every single year. And the mourning was both personal and it was corporate. That day of atonement, you were meant to mourn your own sin. You were meant to, to, to and, and I say the word mourn, but I want to use another word. You were meant to own your sin. You were meant to own who you were, what was wrong, and then you would receive God's forgiveness through the sacrifice that was made. You would then receive that. But as time went on and as their humiliation had become so, so much more than they had ever experienced, they began to add more days of fasting. Nothing wrong with that. Really a sweet thing to just say, we're going to declare a day of fasting. Fasting just meant let's skip the, the food. Let's not waste time. That's what it was. It was a, let's not waste time. Now, preparing food, most of you would say, that's not time wasted. Right? But this is the idea. Let's not use that time to prepare food. Let's use that time to mourn our losses and to invite a God who brings victory over shame to help us. And on the outside, the questions that these Jews were asking their leadership seem very sincere. Hey, should we continue to mourn? Should we continue to fast? Should we continue to do all these things? But before we read any more, I want to say a few things about this. Because I think that we have to remember that as Christians, our Christian faith is connected to an actual relationship with God. You see, what happened was, what began as a day to fast and mourn and remember the shame that had come, had become a tradition for everybody. In year one, people did it out of just like this sense of like, Oh, let's weep for what we've lost and let's invite, God, let us never forget you again. Lord, we're going to remember you forever. And then you're two and then you're three and then you're 30 and then you're 40 and then you're 70. You see, what happens is that over time, the people moved away from seeing this as something that was a sincere expression of mourning and it just became the thing that you do. That's how a lot of people go to church. This is what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to, you know, or if you've been a Christian a long time, what are you supposed to do? You got to read your Bible, you got to pray, you got to give, you got to do all those things. And there's nothing wrong with the, those things, but what had happened is that they had become a, 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 a block with the people seeing their need for God because if I just do the thing that we always do, then I'm fine. I'm good. As long as I do the thing that's expected, right? The Jews would say it something like this. You go to the temple, you offer your sacrifice, you sing your songs, you read the scrolls, and you try to keep the Ten Commandments. Muslims say something like this, keep the fast and love Allah. Catholics would say, pray the Hail Marys, go to Mass. Calvary San Diego say, read the Bible, go to church, generally be a good person, worship, sit closer to the front, you're really spiritual. <laughs> Sinners in the back, but no, I'm just kidding. We all have our little rituals. You know, we think of, you know, other religions and we're like, oh yeah, man, they got so many rituals. But this is my chair. Somebody's sitting in my pew on Sunday morning. How dare you, sir, right? We all have these things. I'm not putting it down. It's just, a, it's something that's built into every single one of us. And while we disagree with other religious groups in truth, 
We're no different if we base our relationship with God on the idea of ritual. Nothing wrong with ritual. But when ritual replaces connection to God, something is wrong. Imagine a marriage like that. You would say, like, you know, wives, if you, would, if you said, man, if I never had to tell my husband to take out the trash or do the dishes or clean up laundry, again, it would be amazing. But you could have somebody do all of those things but still be in a terrible situation in a marriage, right? You see, the ritual itself won't heal the need for relational connection. Now, relational connection with a husband who does dishes, girls, would that make you happier? Okay, uh, some of you are clapping, and you okay, that, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that goes true. I mean, you can put this into any context that you want, but you understand what I'm saying. You can have somebody who does all the things that they should do, and you could be still living in, a, in, a, in hell. On the opposite side, man, you could, have, you could have somebody who doesn't keep any of the rituals. They don't do any of those things, but they bring so much joy and life into your life. Too often we put into our own Christian lives, a ritual, nothing wrong with those. But when that becomes the means by which I connect to God alone, I miss the big picture of it all. I was made for a relationship with God. So look at God's response. Verse 4, Zechariah 7, the word of the Lord of hosts came to me and said, say to all the people of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? For me? When you eat and when you drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Should you not have obeyed the words which the Lord proclaimed through the former prophets when Jerusalem and the cities around it were inhabited and prosperous, and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? God's message is this. We'll stop right there. I'd rather you be obedient than offer me the routines of your mourning and your sadness. I would rather you offer me obedience than all of your routines. It looks good on the outside, but it's just not what I want. That's what God is saying here. And this needs to be emphasized to every single one of us. If God wants repentance, humility, and obedience, and we offer him our sadness, what does that say about the way we see God? If God's like, I just want you to like, be humble and obey me, and we're like, oh, Lord, I'm really sorry for what I did, but you know, this is who I am. It's not just a disregard of the word of God, but it's actually a disrespect of the person of God. I'm disrespecting God. I'm saying, God, I know it's what you want, but this is what I can do. This is all I got. And it happens over and over. We misunderstand what God wants. We think God wants us to feel bad for doing wrong things and to try harder. That's what it means to be a Christian. Feel bad and try harder. Feel bad and try harder. I am all for feeling bad and I'm all for trying harder. But those do not define a relationship with God. Imagine a marriage like that where you constantly were feeling bad and know you had to try harder. How long will you stay married? Let me answer from somebody who does a lot of marriage counseling. Not long. It won't be long. If your whole relationship is feel bad and try harder, feel bad and try harder. Friends, it's no way to have a relationship with God either. When he's inviting me into a life where I'm just, I'm, I humbly receive from him and I obey him. I follow him. And God shows me that my attitude is wrong. The right response is this. God, you're right. That's what the Bible describes as repentance. It's not my, oh, I'm so sad. Oh, I'm so bad. Oh, I'm so terrible. Oh, I'm so this. That's not repentance. That's another way of drawing attention to yourself. Repentance is this. God, you're right. God, you're right. And you might be crying about that when you say that. You might not be crying about that. That's not the issue. Emotions are all good. Don't get me wrong. Go all in. But just understand, repentance is not built upon how sad you feel, but upon obedience to Christ. Just a simple thing of, Lord, this is the direction I'm going, and this is what you're telling me to do, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go that way. You're right, Lord. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. We have to learn repentance, God's way, humility, obedience over ritual that make me feel better about myself, but don't really produce a relational connection to God. I can have an emotional breakdown of how bad I am, 
But friends, if that doesn't draw me closer to Jesus, then, then it didn't do me any good. What I need is I need to acknowledge God in all my ways and let him direct my paths. You see, what rituals tend to do is they tend to make me either arrogant, angry, or both. When I follow the rules only, when that's my, 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 my religious jam, when that's my Christianity, it makes me arrogant, angry, or both. Here's arrogant. Arrogant is this. I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. I'm better than you. Angry. God, why is my life not better? I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. Or both. I am better than so many people and God isn't doing enough for me. Arrogant, angry, or both. Look at Zechariah chapter 7, verse 8. And the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion. Everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. God's not telling people to just do these things. He's saying that through a repentant and a humble heart, practice justice and righteousness. Where repentance is, justice and righteousness will flow. Empathy and compassion. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of, a, I want to be the kind of Christian that cares more about people above ramifications whatever they might be, social, economic, political, whatever, people first. And you say, wait, it's God first. It's always God first. It's always God. But then that relational connection to God builds inside of me an understanding that humanity matters. We are literally, besides God, we are the, we are the thread of the scriptures. We are the thread of history. God's redemptive work towards humanity. People like you and like me and like your, your terrible uncle. I don't know if you have one and he's sitting next to you. Don't look at him. Uh, your, you know, whoever it might be, that neighbor you can't say, whatever it might be, that person is loved by God. Now, again, you might be like, oh, okay, good. Now you made me feel bad. Now I just know I need to try harder. No, remember, that's not what we're going after as believers we're not going after a thing where we just say, I feel bad, and now I, I just got to try harder. But we recognize that God honors and loves humility and obedience. That's what repentance is. It's humility and then obeying. Chapter 8, beginning in verse 1 of Zechariah, the word of the Lord of hosts came again, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I'm zealous for Zion with great zeal, with great fervor I am zealous for her. Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. God is promising a renewal, and he'll talk more about this in the rest of the book, among the people. A renewal that they had not experienced in a long, long time. God was going to bring great blessings upon the people. So much so that the past days of fasting would become days of celebration. They were going to go from fast to feast. Verse 18 and 19 of, Jack, of Zechariah 8. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and of the fifth, and of the seventh, and of the tenth, shall be joy and gladness, cheerful feasts. For the house of Judah, therefore, love truth and peace. So fast to festival or feast because of the blessings of God in their future. Look at verse 20. Thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall yet come inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city will go to another saying, let's continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will also go. Yes, many people and strong nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Thus says the Lord, in those days, ten men from every language of the nations will grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. We call them Israel tours today, by the way. This is like, you know, this is basically what it looks like today when everybody's like, oh, we should go to Israel. You're welcome. There's the prophecy fulfilled, okay? I want to mention a few things about what we've just read in these verses here. These verses are all good, 
They're beautiful, in fact. God promising that the days that were of mourning and fasting would become days of celebration and of feasting. They would, I mean, that, that, you know, what does it take? What would it take in our lives? Just think about this. On your hardest days, the days that, like, when it comes, days of loss, when you remember the person that you've lost, what would it take? I mean, seriously, just ponder this for a moment. What would it take to turn that day from a day of, like, heartache to a day of feasting? And not, like, falsely doing that, like, let's just make it a celebration even though it's terrible. No, no, no. What would it take in your heart to turn this from mourning to celebration? Let me tell you. If you lost somebody, let me tell you. I'll tell you exactly what it is. You ready? Resurrection. It's the only thing that will fix it all, is resurrection. You know, somebody who's grieving loss, they will never get over that, ever. It's a tragedy when somebody says, oh, you know, time will heal all things. Time does not heal all things. But you know what will heal all things? Resurrection. The power of God over death forever. One day, one day that will be our realities. That's why we're so passionate about people knowing Christ. So that one day, no matter, <laughs> no matter when our end happens here, we can have that assurance of an eternal life with Christ. That's why it matters so much. And imagine these people are being told by God here in Zechariah in chapter 8 that one day all of your days of mourning and of loss, and you think of these people who were fasting on the 4th and the 5th and the 10th months, they didn't just fast because of some national issue. I imagine for many of them it was very personal. When war in Ukraine is finished, there will be days of mourning that happen every year, and it'll be different for every single person because for many of them, it will not be like, oh, our nation went through a hard thing. It'll be, this is the day when this person was gone. This was the day when that happened. It's personal. I want you to see the scriptures personalized for each one of our lives and not just in its, in its backdrop. You know, days like today, we celebrate, you know, I mean, you moms, we, we're so happy to celebrate with you. And I'm also aware that in this room, there are people who want to be moms who are not yet. Or who have lost someone, who have lost their mom. Friends, the, 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 the scope of joy all the way to mourning is tremendous in any given moment, in any given room, in any given circumstance. But we have a God who is a healer and a redeemer. What is the hope that will turn fasting into feasting, it's resurrection. That one day our God will redeem all of us in Christ. But I think that we need to have a little bit of a, an, a sense of empathy along the road today. Because I think a lot of times, like, we hear the promises of God, and I know we've all, I la we laugh about it because it's happened to all of us. If you've been a Christian for a week, it's happened to you, probably. And it's this, it's like, you start, you have a bad day, and then somebody reminds you of a promise of God, and that's supposed to make you feel better, but it doesn't totally make you feel better. It makes you kind of feel worse, and then it makes you feel worse about that person that told you that promise. Like, I don't like this, and you're a jerk, okay, at the same moment. Why? Because our expectations are not always in sync with the word of God. Oh, God is going to restore all things. Yeah, I'm not living in that today. I'm not living in that today. You're not living in that today. Today might be a good day, but you're not living in all things belonging to God and under his perfect, perfect world. That's what we're waiting for in heaven. And I think sometimes we hear the promises of you know, re, um, of repentance and grace and forgiveness and love and peace. And we're like, I ain't feeling none of that stuff right now. I am bitter at what's happened to me. I am hurt by these things. And before we just, and then we can throw a promise that, oh yeah, well, all things will be made new. And we're like, yeah, but it ain't my reality right now. And this is the quandary of what it means to be a Christian. We live in, we live in two worlds, you could say. We live in a world that will be perfect and be perfected by a beautifully perfect God. And then we live here. 
And friends, San Diego is nice. Amen? It ain't heaven. Amen? No more mortgage. No more taxes. No, hey, I got you. I got you. All right, now you're, now you're all awake. I should have started with that. If I had started there, I'd have you all, right? No more hospital bills. The Bible says no more tears. No more suffering. But we're not there yet. I think of parents, just moms, I think of parents who pour so much into their kids, you know, and then and maybe now, as uh, maybe one of your kids has gotten a bit older and isn't walking with the Lord, and you're just like, and you, go, you default back to normal Christianity. You feel bad, and you try harder. You feel bad, and you try harder. What did I do wrong? What did I do this? And, and you forget that they're a human agent made by God with, 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 a, with a choice, with their own thing. You want to take it all, but you can't take it all no more than you can take, no more than you can say, I'm the reason they turned out good. You know, we just get it all, but we take it all. And, you, and we live, oh, one day everything's going to be perfect. And you're like, yeah, it's mom's day and it's not perfect. It's not perfect. This was the reality of the Jews when Zechariah wrote this. And that's why you and I have to remember there is what God is doing today and there's what he's going to do in our future. And we, we can't try to like, you know, sometimes somebody's suffering today and we try to quote them a promise for heaven and we're like, stop being sad because one day. And you're like, yeah, but this day stinks. And you know what you can do? You know what we can do? If, you're having, if your day stinks today, just let it, let it ride. Believe that God is present. Cry. Feel the loss that you're feeling. If your day's amazing today, we need you to have joy. We need you to have life. We need, we, let us celebrate with you. The Bible says that. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. It's everywhere, all the time, all the things. Find out where, know where you're at. Don't be disappointed in God because I'm telling you, one day resurrection will change everything. Today can be tough. Not just Mother's Day, any day. Mondays, Mondays probably aren't your favorite day. Whatever it might be. The Jews came back into the land, and I'll finish with this. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up and close us in some worship. The, the Jews came back into the land of, of Israel, really not Israel, but Jerusalem. They came back to Jerusalem with like so much hope for, you know, we're going to rebuild, we're going to have a temple and a, a city and all these things. And they had no modern... Uh, you know, equipment for m removing rubble. The city was in shambles. Everything was broken down. It was terrible. And they literally had to try to rebuild in that. They literally had to try to rebuild their city in this moment. And again, you know, I think that we're meant to, like, it's okay for us to flash into life today for understanding of what that would have been like. You just have to, like, you know, you turn on any social media, you watch anything that's happening in Ukraine right now, and you go, wow, that city is gone. So many of our joys and mine friends, their apartments are gone. Their church buildings are gone. Their, the school that their kids went to is gone. One of the cities that we focused all of our attention, medical attention, all three hospitals, gone. It's tragedy upon tragedy. And you're not going to walk over there and say, oh, it's okay, one day everything's going to be amazing. It's the truth, but it doesn't really bring healing, does it? And God's word to the people then was this, one day, and this is an important message for you and me, one day, your fasting will turn into feasting. Not because you'll forget or time will heal all wounds. We've all had loss, and there is no, no eternity will, will heal the loss that I feel about certain people. No, you, won't, you won't heal that. 50 years won't heal that unless I just lose my memory. And that's its own problem. But you know what will heal all things? The redemption of Christ over this world for eternity. And forever and ever and ever. And that's what's coming. So for those who mourn today, we mourn with you. Those who rejoice, we rejoice with you. We just get to be in the place that God's put us in. But here's my final thought to you. 
Ritual will not heal. It'll do damage. You try to do ritual to make yourself feel better in your hurt, it will not help. Instead, turn yourself more towards a relational connection to Christ. Embrace him in a deeper way. Well, how do I exactly do that? Create a relationship with God and develop that relationship with him. Father, I thank you so much for your word today. The privilege that it is, God, of taking time to unpack something that you said to your people thousands of years ago that's still applicable to us today. That's the thing about your word, God. We believe that it's still real and present and alive right now. Lord, I pray for us. I pray today that no ritual would take the place of a deep, deep, abiding connection with Christ. Take a moment before we sing, before we finish. Take a moment and just, in your own way, in your own heart, offer repentance to him. Lord, forgive me for, and then you fill in the blanks, wherever you're at. What are the areas of your life that you just, you need a fresh start, a clean start? Maybe God's showing you a person you need to apologize to or show gratitude for. Whatever it is, I, I believe in the Holy Spirit's power right now to show us. Not for our humiliation, but for our healing and our wholeness that, that, that fasting in this part of our life where there's been shame and hurt could turn to feasting today where the big picture of it all isn't gonna happen until the resurrection, but at least for today, we can experience something fresh in our hearts. So Lord, please forgive me for, Lord, help me in. I wanna walk in humility, God, and in your graciousness, and in your love, and in the beauty of your holiness and in forgiveness and in truth. And Lord, I just so thank you, God, that you gave, you gave everything so that we could have relationship. We could know you. We could, we could follow you. We could hear from you. We could live and walk in your ways. And no, we don't do it perfectly, but it's, it's still ours, Lord. We get to be with you. I thank you so much for that, God. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.